welcome everybody today to the Food Thinkers on October 27, 2021. Um, Food Thinkers, of course, this year is a um, organization that is bringing together the big ideas from women in academia, policy and business and advocacy on how to redesign the food system. It's a really exciting mix of food thinker seminars we've had over the last year and will continue to have for the rest of 2021. And tonight we have probably one of the mo uh, my most favorite academics. Um, you can see I'm gushing um, with how excited I am to hear Jennifer Clapp speak today on corporate concentration and power in the agricultural input sector. Um, Jennifer Clapp is a Canada Research Chair in Global Food Security and Sustainability and Professor in the School of Environment, Resources and Sustainability at the University of Waterloo. Congratulations to Jennifer for her recent appointment as Vice Chair of the High Level Panel of Experts on Food Security and Nutrition, and also being a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. So two amazing organizations that she is involved with. Jennifer has published widely on the global governance of problems that arise at the intersection of global economy, food security and food systems, and the nature of and the natural environment. And I know that she is found, um, our, our texts of hers are found on many of the different parts of the Masters in Food Policy here at City. Her recent books include Food, Third Edition, published in 2020, and Speculative Harvests, Financialization, Food and Agriculture in 2018, which has been a book by my bedside for the last few months, which has been a great read. Um, um, Likewise, today she has just published a viewpoint in the journal Food Policy, which is titled The Case for a Six-Dimensional Food Security Framework. And I was reading it just before this, and it is an amazing viewpoint. I encourage you all to seek it out after this to um, have a read through the um, uh, re-examination of what it means to be food secure and food security. It's brilliant work there, Jennifer, and her co-authors. But without anything else, please put your questions into the Q&A box and welcome Jennifer Clapp. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, it's an honor to be here and I'm, I'm blushing. That was a very nice introduction. Um, and I'm happy to be here today to speak about some of my uh, recent research on corporate concentration and power in the agricultural input sector and its implications for food systems more broadly. Now, this talk draws on some recent research I've been doing uh, in the past months on the history of corporate dominance across a range of uh, input industries and the relevance of corporate concentration in the sector for debates about food sustainability today. Uh, with so much talk in recent years about the need to transform food systems to arrive at more just and sustainable outcomes, it's essential that we understand the dynamics of corporate power in food systems, including drawing lessons from history. But this conversation did not take place in the UN Food System Summit that was held last month. Uh, it didn't take place at least to any meaningful extent. Corporate power was barely mentioned. Now, I began this work on this theme of corporate power and concentration in the food system well before the Food System Summit was even announced. So this work is not simply a reaction to the summit. Uh, it's an attempt to look more deeply at some of the big challenges facing efforts to achieve food system transformation that are posed by corporate dominance in the sector. Now, I want to give a bit of a caveat at the start. This is some, much of this is new material for me and I'm in the middle of the research and this talk was a great opportunity for me to try and draw some of the threads together and distill uh, some of the lessons. But if anything's unclear at this point, I apologize and I really do welcome uh, your feedback. I'm simply presenting to you some things that I have found really fascinating uh, about the history and trying to understand what kinds of lessons we can draw from that uh, for the present. Okay, so with that, I will, I will get started. Um, I've organized my talk around three big questions that have really been driving my own research in the past, uh, past months. First off, how long has the agricultural input sector been dominated by just a few firms? Second, in what ways have concentrated firms exerted power in the food system and with what effect? And third, what are the lessons for contemporary debates on food systems transformation? Now, in answering this, these questions, I'm going to make several arguments in this talk. And 
people tease me because I always give away uh, my argument at the beginning, but I think it's important uh, so that you have signposts for where I'm heading. But the points I really wanna make is that corporate concentration of power in the food system has really long roots, uh, especially with respect to agricultural inputs. These firms are not big and powerful simply because they're the most efficient or competitive firms. Large firms have had specific advantages throughout history that enable them to become really big. And so, you know, it's sort of a, trying to give us some understanding of those long roots. And one of the points I wanna make is that while the literature often mentions uh, a corporate food regime emerging since the 1980s with a rise of neoliberalism, if we look at inputs specifically, we see that the timescale is much longer than that and goes back to the early 1900s. Uh, a second key argument I wanna make is that these firms have been able to exert different kinds of power over food systems for over a century, which enables them to shape markets, to shape, shape technological innovation pathways, and to shape the policy context in ways that really matter for food systems. They matter for equity, they matter for livelihoods, environment, and democratic participation. And finally, I want to make the case that, that uh, if we want to transform food systems to be more just and sustainable, then we must pay attention to corporate power in the food system. The Food System Summit, as I mentioned, failed to take this issue seriously, and it offers some policy suggestions uh, for governance processes going forward. The first question then, how long has the agricultural input sector been dominated by just a few firms? And as you can tell uh, by this picture, I wanna make the case that the roots, the roots run deep. Now today, all along agri-food agri supply chains, we see corporate concentration and consolidation taking place on a regular basis. The top four firms in each of these nodes on this slide uh, across the global food system really control a considerable amount of the market. And that concentration and, and control is especially um, high in the input sector. And that's specifically uh, where I'm focusing. And I started out this research and fully intending to focus only on seeds and agrochemicals. But when I got into the reading and, and into the, the deep history around this sector, I realized it was almost impossible to separate seeds and chemicals out from the questions of farm machinery and uh, fertilizers. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big story in a way, but it's really important because all of these elements were important in the initial rise of the industrial agricultural model um, that began in, in Western countries, in the US in particular, in the 1920s and 30s, uh, and also was spread on a global scale through the Green Revolution uh, since the 1950s. So while it's a bit overwhelming, it's been overwhelming for me, I have to admit, researching all of these issues. Um, I'm trying to go systematically through the different uh, sectors, but they do interlock in important ways and hopefully um, this talk won't be overwhelming, but will help you to see some of those interconnections. So when we talk about corporate concentration and power in the food system today, we're often highlighting how agricultural input markets are becoming more concentrated and they have become more concentration, concentrated in recent decades. Uh, this this um, graphic on the slide here shows that the top four firms in agrochemicals and seeds that the, their percentage of control of the market really has increased in recent decades. And this is where I started with the research. Uh, since 2015, uh, Bayer bought Monsanto, ChemChina bought Syngenta, and then it merged with Sinochem. Uh, and now it's being referred, the agriculture element is, is Syngenta Group. Um, Dow and DuPont merged together and spun off a new agricultural division called Corteva. Uh, and in the space of like a year and a half, we went from what we used to call the big six that were dominating the sector to just the big four. But also in 2016, uh, we saw a huge merger in the fertilizer sector where Potash Corporation and, and Agrium, both Canadian companies, merged to form a new entity called Nutrien, which is now the largest fertilizer company in the world. And alongside this, the farm machinery sector has always been highly concentrated. And there were even attempts in 2016 around the same time uh, of John Deere, one of the big, biggest uh, farm machinery companies, to buy up the digital farming firm precision planting in 2016, but they were, they were actually stopped from doing that uh, over antitrust concerns. So this seemingly ever increasing concentration and consolidation was a key concern I had when I started into this research, but I wanted to know more about the origins of these companies. And when I started into that work, I realized quite quickly that these sectors have actually been highly concentrated for well over a century, at least in the US where many of these uh, industries became first um, in, industrialized. 
And this spread since that time globally. And now we see these as transnational corporations that are dominating the global markets. So while we are seeing these new dynamics of concentration today, and it, it is getting worse in recent decades, it's also important to remember that this concentration in the sector has been longstanding. And it's actually seen ebbs and flows over time. And in my own work, and I'm going to be trying to do more of trying to understand when it becomes more and less concentrated over that period. But just in general, uh, it's been quite concentrated overall. So I just want to give some examples from, from history. And I'm going to start with uh, farm machinery. Um, it's been really fun to be reading about the history of, of these uh, companies that started in farm machinery. Uh, in 1831, Cyrus H. McCormick invented the mechanical reaper. Uh, he was in Virginia at the time, and, and with the help from one of his slaves, I might add, uh, he invented this, this uh, machine that could be pulled by a horse and mechanically uh, harvest wheat. Um, and by the time of his death in the late 1800s, the McCormick Reaper Company was one of the biggest firms in the US, and it was the biggest uh, agricultural machinery company. And it even began marketing its uh, reapers internationally by the mid 1800s. So really early on, this had become a major global corporation. And the other companies that emerged to produce mechanical reapers uh, in the US, so um, there were some other early machinery um, being developed in Scotland, but McCormick, he had a patent and a first mover advantage, and he capitalized on economies of scale that came with a rise of mass production during the Industrial Revolution. So in the late 1800s, um, new implements like the combine came on board, and the, the companies were, were producing a range of, of machinery. In 1902, um, four, four other companies merged um, with uh, the McCormick Reaper Company, and they formed a new entity called the International Harvester. And this was known as a trust. And this was the time in the US when these big, big trusts were emerging. And it was, these trusts were often um, arranged by big financial um, companies. And so in this case, the deal was brokered by the House of Morgan, which is, you know, of JP Morgan fame. Uh, and it, it, it formed a massive entity that controlled around 85% of the US market for farm implements at the time. So it was just huge. And again, it was one of the biggest companies by size in the US overall of all the industries. And so by the early 1900s, there were just four big makers of farm machinery. Um, and this, in the early 1900s, this was just as gasoline power tractors were starting to take off. And so the big companies at the time were International Harvester, by far the dominant one, John Deere, uh, Massey Harris, and Alice Chalmers. And they all made tractors and were fiercely competitive with one another. And they often you know, refer to this period as the Harvester Wars. So I wanted to trace those early companies to what we see in the sector today. And it's really interesting because those early machineries really are ancestors of three of the biggest companies that dominate the market for farm machinery today. So these include CNH, which is actually a com combination of International Harvester plus Ford, which started to make tractors a bit later and tried to outcompete International Harvester, um, merging with Case and New Holland earlier companies. So this is what you see, if you drive past farmer tra uh, tractor dealers, you'll see CN CNH or Case New Holland. Uh, that's the company that International Harvester is now part of. Uh, John Deere, John Deere started his operations in 1837, and he is, this is still um, the same named company, and it's just continuously grown over time. Uh, another big company today is Agco, which is, stands for the Alice Gleaner Corporation, which is a product of Alice Chalmers and Massey Ferguson, which are British uh, and Canadian farm machinery company. And now today, Kubota is one of the big uh, companies, and it's a Japanese industrial company that only started making tractors in 1947. So today, these firms control um, around 50% of the global market. Now, I want to talk about seeds as well. Seeds is a really interesting agricultural input because, of course, since the dawn of agriculture 10,000 years ago, uh, obviously, seeds have been self uh, reproducing and they have seeds haven't been market goods. Farmers have been able to select seeds from their own harvest and plant them the next season and, and choose the best varieties uh, to improve their crops over time. The indigenous peoples of North America cultivated and selected corn in North America for thousands of years. Uh, and so for these reasons, seeds didn't really develop, as I said, into a normal market good until actually quite recently. Um, and there was a period from around the mid to late 1800s to around the 1920s, uh, which was still a period of new Euro European settlement and displacement of indigenous peoples in North America, uh, when private seed companies began to emerge. And the first seed companies actually 
were not just um, developing new seeds themselves. They were, they were sort of cleaning seeds or reproducing seeds that government researchers were developing using selection methods, the, the age old methods of selection. Um, and these were given out freely to farmers who were settling on the land. And uh, what we saw in the early um, 1900s was government sponsored research into the development of hybrid seed varieties. So around the 1920s, we really saw hybrids uh, come of age, so to speak. And I don't want to get into the whole like science of, of breeding hybrids, but basically hybrid um, seed production is, is a method of, of trying to increase the vigor of the seed, but the offspring of that hybrid seed is not as, um, doesn't give as high a yield as, as the original. And so what it meant is that seeds had to be reproduced every year. And this was done by private companies. And so in a way it sort of hybridization built in intellectual property protection right into the seed. And uh, some of the seed companies that were around at the time really obviously picked up on the fact that this was an opportunity for profit, that they could charge farmers for seeds every year, and that could cover their costs for research and development. And so this is this is sort of what started to go on um, with the seed research at the time, much of it then moving from the public sector, and I should say the public sector was investing a lot into hybridization and, and research and freely giving uh, their research results to the private sector, who then turned around uh, and made it sort of uh, a private market good. Uh, and so this possibility to make profit from the hybridization of seeds um, led to more concentration in the seed sector. But I, I should say there were many seed companies around at the time, uh, but only four major companies came to dominate research and development for hybrids. And that's Funk Brothers, Pioneer Hybrid, DeKalb and Pfister. And they're all in that area, three of them in Illinois and another in uh, Iowa in the US, which was the Corn Belt. Uh, because this hybrid was hybridization was all that research was all done on corn. So while there were perhaps as many as 150 or 200 other seed companies, these seed companies were actually reproducing the varieties developed by these four companies. And the four companies at the time in the 1930s to 50s, they they controlled as much as 50% of the U.S. seed market. So quite quite significant quite early on. And so as we see here, the big four in the early 20th century have a clear lineage to the dominant companies today. Um, and we, you know, it's, you can look through the graph to see what, what was happening. But basically, um, in this period, we, we saw the original four companies getting purchased and merging with other companies, but not just other seed companies. What's really interesting in this story is they were merging, in, especially in the 1970s to 1990s, with uh, agrochemical companies. And there's a, a story here that is quite interesting is that the agricultural chemical companies were finding that their cost for research and development of new pesticides and herbicides was becoming more and more expensive because of the rise of environmental regulations. So they turned their eyes to thinking about buying seed companies to modify seeds to work with existing chemicals. So it was just too expensive for them to develop um, new chemicals. So they decided to focus on agricultural biotechnology. But that was only possible because uh, governments were making it, um, were expanding intellectual property protection to seeds and living forms that allowed the rise of genetic modification. So what we saw then is all those four original seed companies eventually got merged and swallowed into uh, three of the big companies that we see today. Um, and then a fourth uh, company that is newly producing seeds is BASF, which ended up buying up some of the assets that Bayer was forced to sell when they bought Monsanto. So now we have about four companies controlling 60% of the global seed market and around um, those same four companies, interestingly, control around 70% of the global agrochemical market. Um, so this is an interesting story because seed research and development was largely a government role up till the 1920s. Uh, and then when intellectual property protection became built into the seed with hybridization, that research got taken over by the private companies and that still is the case today. Now I'm gonna just say a little bit about fertilizers and, and agrochemicals more generally, and I'm still thick in the research on this and I haven't been able to map out all of the firms yet because there's actually a lot of them and I think the story is a little bit different uh, in this area. But I just wanna say that uh, these are really fascinating parts of the agricultural inputs um, sector and the companies involved. It's, it's a really, really interesting story. Um, fertilizers are super fascinating because there are many different uh, elements that can be fertilizers themselves. 
um, nitrogen and uh, nitrates, potash, phosphorus, historical use of guano, so a lot of mining involved. Um, but it was in the early 1900s when, when uh, chemical research um, was, it had breakthrough in, in the, the, um, the making of synthetic um, nitrogen through chemical processes that really transformed the sector. And this uh, was government sponsored research uh, for the war effort because nitrogen can be used uh, in explosives as, as well as uh, a fertilizer. So it's a super interesting story. Um, and similarly with the pesticide and herbicide companies, um, they, they often were coming out of earlier companies that were focused on um, industrial dyes and, and other kinds of um, explosives, what they called powder, powder companies like uh, DuPont. Um, and they eventually went into um, making insecticides and then herbicides. Um, so it's a bit of a different story, but these were really big uh, companies at the start. The illustration I have on the slide here is BASF from 1901, uh, which was reported to be the largest chemical company in the world at the time. And it was making both fertilizers and agrochemicals. So I'm excited to continue my research uh, on, on this uh, in this area. So I just want to say a bit about, you know, how did these firms come to dominate early on? Now, many economists would say um, that the long-standing pattern of concentration in the sector is simply because these firms are more efficient uh, and that there are economies of scale. In other words, um, they can produce more cheaply if they produce on a big scale. Um, so in a way, they sort of say it's natural that these firms would be large because of these reasons. Uh, and they would often add in that you know, these economies of scale can bring costs down, uh, which means that these companies can deliver same savings to farmers by producing their products more cheaply. And so this is a pretty standard explanation for bigness uh, coming from the economics uh, field. Um, but I, what, what I'm trying to show in my research is that this explanation doesn't include some factors that really do matter. Um, and, and that's beyond these, this sort of issues of economies of scale. And I don't wanna downplay that economies of scale matter, but other things matter too. And so these firms, as I'm trying to show, they've had market advantages that not just that efficiency at scale, but they've had access to wealthy private financiers who were um, brokering mergers. They had first mover benefits um, within an industrializing economy. They had um, many of these companies across the input sectors developed extensive national and international dealer and marketing networks that included credit and provision of free products as a way to lure, um, lure farmers in. And they had access to capital to expand to worldwide markets. So they had those kind of market advantages, but they also had technology advantages. And we know that technological change opens new opportunities, um, but in many cases, these firms benefited from government-sponsored technological research and development. And that was the case in seeds, it was the case in, in fertilizers, definitely. Um, and as we said, in some cases, it, it gave uh, intellectual property protection uh, to those firms. And they also, these firms also had regulatory advantages. They benefited from weak antitrust rules when many of these firms first came online. Um, some of those rules were tightened up, but then they were loosened again. And so these companies have been able for a century to stay pretty big. Um, and they also have been able to benefit from regulations that have expanded intellectual property protection into new areas such as uh, life forms and seeds. And they, they basically were also able to benefit from government policies that encouraged uh, industrialization of farming. So governments uh, encourage farmers to buy tractors, for example, um, encourage them to adopt hybrids. So these advantages gave these firms, when they had this first mover advantage, an ability to be very large and to, in a sense, squeeze out other competitors. So I want to shift to talk about the ways in which these firms have been able to exert power in the sector and uh, with what effect. And I have to say, I love this image that I found uh, online because at the time when, when gasoline power tractors were first coming uh, onto the market, that was referred to as power farming. And I thought, well, this is very apt uh, for this theme. So I want to talk about these different ways companies can exert power. First, they've been had the power to shape market dynamics. And this is sometimes referred to by economists as market power. And this kind of market power has long been a concern um, because in a way there's, there's a fear that when firms are really big and they can control the market, they will constrain competition in ways that could be harmful. It could lead to higher prices and less choice for consumers. And this problem of market power is longstanding. Um, 
in the in the agricultural input sector and the fertilizer sector interestingly is one of one of the worst for this kind of behavior uh, cartels and price fixing have been rampant in that sector for a very long time um, some recent research shows that there have been 73 what are called hardcore cartel episodes um, over the 1920 to 1910 period, meaning basically these firms were getting together and colluding to fix prices. Um, in the farm machinery sector, there were also other market shaping practices. So for example, International Harvester actually shared board members with US Steel, which was another big trust that was also brokered by uh, JP Morgan. And they actually had these rebate deals, what we would call today kickbacks, um, that gave them lower prices for steel for their products, which enabled them to um, basically uh, crush the co competition because they couldn't keep up. So it was a huge barrier to, to entry for other firms. So shaping that market uh, has been quite important. And this problem of concentration affecting prices is ongoing, uh, though it's not always easy to quantify. And part of the reason is a lot of the data out there, especially on pricing around uh, seeds, for example, is proprietary data and it's hard to get your hands on it, unless you've got $100,000 in your back pocket to pay uh, for that data. Um, but some recent studies have actually gotten some of this data and shown that high levels of market concentration is at least one significant factor contributing to higher seed prices today. Um, and in a number of markets around the world, the top firms control over 80% of the market for specific crops like corn or soy. So when they have that, you know, in some markets, it's only two companies controlling, controlling that much of the market. And it's easier for them uh, simply to charge higher prices because they know that farmers uh, have a demand for it. And I just want to briefly state another example. This is a super interesting case, um, is the uh, Farmers Business Network. And you might have heard about this. It's an online retail company that started up to sell farm inputs. And what's really interesting about this case is that the big companies that sell these inputs like Bayer and Corteva, Syngenta, BASF, and Nutrien, um, they don't sell their products online. It's not like any other product where you can go search on Amazon and see what the, what the going price is. They, you can't do that. You have to buy through licensed dealers. And what happened was that Farmers Business Network wanted to set up an online retail operation and sell these products. Um, so they bought some of the products from some of the licensed dealers, and then those licensed dealers were uh, cut out uh, from the big companies, and they refused to deal with Farmers Business Network. And so it, it resulted in a suit, an antitrust lawsuit in the last year, at both in Canada and the U.S., against these big companies, uh, because they're really trying to to shape the market in a way that works with their traditional way of doing business. But it's really interesting because there's no price transparency in this sector. Um, and, and these companies do what's called regional pricing where the price of uh, fertilizer might be a completely different for the same product in one part of uh, the country that from another part of the country. And so without driving you know, miles and miles to go from store to store, you would never know what those uh, differential pricing is. And so this is a really interesting case and it will be fascinating to see how it, how it turns out. Uh, when there's a small number of concentrated firms in the sector, they also have enormous power to shape innovation within food systems. And I think this is another really important aspect that isn't easily captured in current antitrust policy. Um, and the firms often say they have to be big so that they can afford expensive research and development to bring us new innovations. Um, but when there's a small number of firms at the top of the market that can also work in ways that impede or constrain innovation, especially when there's high barriers to entry, it could lead to no incentive for innovation because there's no competition basically. Um, but it's not just this question of whether innovation happens at all, it's actually the type of innovation that really matters. And uh, the firms at the top of the sector uh, they typically invest in innovations that basically bring them more profits. Why, why wouldn't they? Um, so they're not necessarily innovating for you know, the benefit of society or for the environment. They're benefiting for their profits and they're able to externalize those other costs. And there's some really interesting historical and current examples of this type of technology shaping uh, power that these firms had. Just on the slide, I've got a picture of two, two ears of corn at the same height. That was actually what they were modifying or doing with their hybrid uh, seed research in the 1920s is making corn plants that had the ear appear at the exact same height on every stalk of corn. Why? Because it made it easier to pick that corn with a mechanical picker. They also made the stalks really thick and 
they would resist falling over. Why did they do that? So that those plants could take up more fertilizers. So what we saw was governments were encouraging um, uh, farmers to adopt tractors, they were encouraging them to use fertilizers, and they were encouraging them to use hybrids. And then the hybrid seed developers were able to develop their plants in a way that, in a sense, locked in these technologies into certain pathways. And once a farmer adopted that system, it was really hard to reverse. And this kind of shaping of innovation continues today in the seed sector. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the 1980s and 90s, uh, with the rise of agricultural biotechnology, what firms were doing was modifying seeds to work with specific herbicides that were already online or already uh, developed. Um, and when they, when they did this, it, it helped to ensure their profitability by continuing sales of herbicides. And this is important because their herbicide um, patents were actually running out. So they, they were able to modify seeds and put them under new patent protection that guaranteed the continued sale of the herbicides, which were actually more profitable than the seeds themselves. Um, so these kind of, and I should say, as the graphic shows here on the slide, that the the spraying of glyphosate, which was the key uh, herbicide that many genetically modified seeds were developed to work with, just went through the roof. And we're now seeing all kinds of problems related uh, to glyphosate, concerns about its health and safety, concerns about um, weeds becoming resistant to it, concerns about its environmental impact. So these examples highlight the ways in which industrial agriculture itself has evolved in specific technological pathways that were important to firms um, and that they locked farmers into particular um, packages or technological um, combinations. And, and this has all taken place in a context where uh, private sector research and development in the sector has really been rising in the past 50 years and now, at least in industrialized countries, has surpassed public uh, agricultural research. And the latest technological development trends in digital agriculture really reinforce this point about how corporate driven agricultural innovation is working in ways that ensure their own profits rather than trying to um, reduce the environmental costs of, of industrial agriculture. So the systems that are being developed today, they're still highly mechanized, they're still reliant on chemicals and modified seeds and synthetic fertilizers. But rather than investing in non chemical agriculture, they're simply making the existing system a little bit more efficient and, and, and presenting it to us as being more sustainable. So it may be better on the margin, but it's not moving us away from the model. It's actually reinforcing that model. And what's really interesting right now is that all of the parts of the input sector, the seeds, the chemicals, the fertilizers, as well as the machinery companies, they're all investing uh, in digital agriculture. And so we, we have to be open to the prospect that these companies might themselves uh, merge to become one giant um, kind of uh, one-stop shop uh, in the future. And I wanna state as well that concentrated firms in the agricultural input sector have long shaped the policy agenda. Uh, they, they've done this in many different ways. They've done it through lobbying, they've done it through shaping discourse, and they've done it through structural power. And most directly and obvious is lobbying. I've just put a graphic here showing the recent um, spending by Bayer, uh, and this is its US lobbying uh, in the last um, couple of years. And you can really see that their lobbying spiked quite a bit around 2015, 16, 17. This was exactly the time that Bayer was trying to uh, purchase Monsanto and when glyphosate was being uh, reviewed for renewal, um, its license renewal. And so we saw a huge increase in their spending and this kind of lobby practice is, you know, it's longstanding, we're all quite familiar with it. Um, but, they, but these companies also have power to shape policy in other ways. They can shape public discourse. So for example, the big input companies at the time of the mergers in 2016, they were called into a big hearing to Congress to talk about concentration in the sector. And these, these CEOs all presented a united front to defend uh, their businesses and to defend the mergers. And this kind of discursive strategy is routine and it's been going on for a long time. Uh, we see it in advertising and in general public messaging. I just wanna give the example of one of the more egregious um, episodes of this type of shaping of discourse, um, which is the example of Henry A. Wallace. Um, he started Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company in 1926. And at that time, he was actually editor of a highly influential news magazine called Wallace's Farmer, which had a huge circulation. It, like almost every farmer in the US um, subscribed to this publication at the time. And he actually used 
the editorial pages of the publication to extol the virtues of hybrid corn and to advertise his seeds, which increased his sales. So he was using this public platform uh, to advance his business interests. Now, the firms that dominate in the sector also have what we call um, structural power to influence policy, like simply because they are large in size, they can influence policy and governance. And it's not always easy to demonstrate or, you know, specifically point to episodes of structural power, but there are a few historical examples that I just couldn't resist telling you about. Um, one was in the early 1900s when U.S. President Teddy Roosevelt you know, he, he portrayed himself as a big trust buster. Um, you know, he's gonna go after the big trusts. Um, but he actually suppressed a damning report on the anti antitrust investigation of his own Justice Department into International Harvester. Um, the reason he had personal relationships with JP Morgan who brokered the deal and he viewed International Harvester as what he called a good trust. Um, and he went other, other trust, he went after other trusts, but not um, not International Harvester. And this newspaper headline from 1912 shows the outrage at the time when it was discovered that the report had been suppressed. Now, Roosevelt was out of office by 1909 and um, subsequently the Department of Justice in the US did sue International Harvester for, for antitrust violations. Another example of structural power involves Henry Wallace again, who I just mentioned a minute ago. And as I said, he started Pioneer Hybrid Company in 1926. What's really interesting about him is he went on to become the US Secretary of Agriculture in 1933. And he, his dad, his own father, Henry C. Wallace, was the Secretary of Agriculture before him. And he eventually became Vice President for FDR in 1940. But what's really interesting is he retained financial interest in his firm, Pioneer Hybrid Seed Company, during his time as Secretary of Agriculture, and he openly used the USDA's publications to promote the adoption of hybrids. And further, as the Vice President, he pushed the Rockefeller Foundation to launch the strategy globally uh, via the Green Revolution. I mean, this is a huge conflict of interest uh, that hopefully wouldn't, wouldn't occur today, but it was, it was quite outrageous uh, at the time. Now, I just gave a lot of examples of how concentrated firms have shaped market dynamics, technology and innovation, and policy and governance. And these examples span a century of this kind of influence. And their, their power to shape these domains is expressed in specific effects on the food system through prices, through barriers to entry to new firms, narrowing innovation pathways to focus solely on profit and using governments to push their business interests and avoid prosecution for violations. The impacts on the food system are really important for, for us to identify. Um, it reduces uh, choices for farmers. It causes more inequities because of price changes. There's a reduction in livelihood opportunities for smaller entrepreneurs. It leads to technological lock-in, the externalization of environmental costs, and it undermines democratic participation in food systems and encourages governments to become tethered to the corporate vision of agriculture. And so these kinds of problems of inequities, environmental costs, and weak governance, I, I should stress they're not solely caused by corporate concentration. In other words, that's not the only reason we have these problems in the food system. These are big and complicated problems. But corporate concentration certainly generates dynamics that contribute to these problems in important ways. And the impacts of this concentration on food system, they over the past century has been largely ignored because there was the sense that industrial agriculture was inevitable, that it was necessary to increase food production to address global hunger, and that it was also important for governments who wanted to export their crops and also for farmers who wanted to improve their profit margins. But as we're seeing now, the costs of industrial agriculture really coming back to affect us through climate change, biodiversity loss, Soil, soil exhaustion, inequality and hunger, people are really starting to question uh, this model. And that's really why I wanted to do this research is to go to the, the origins and to see the role that companies were playing in that in the beginning. So how does this longer view of corporate power in the input sector matter for food systems today? Well, the Food System Summit as I, as I said at the outset, it was called to address important concerns, inequities, environmental degradation, and a failure to ensure everyone has an adequate diet. But the deliberations of the summit scarcely mentioned the role of corporate concentration as an area that needs attention. It focused instead on other issues like consumers' responsibility for their own food choices. I'm not saying that's not important, but, but it is important that we identify and discuss corporate power. 
So the documents of the summit scientific group and the action tracks, they really steered clear of connecting concentrated firms and shaping the industrial model that's contributing to the problems we face today. And in fact, the summit took a distinctly ahistorical approach. It was looking forward rather than looking at the past to learn important lessons. And along these lines, the summit actually promoted further technological developments within the industrial model, such as digital, digital farming, which is controlled by the very same firms. And they presented this as solutions. So it's no wonder, though, that this was the featured solution from the summit because the organizers gave big corporations a priority seat at the table. Now, I don't wanna get into the summit dynamics too much, but I just wanna talk a little bit to, to close up about what the summit could have said if it gave more attention to corporate power and concentration and what should be on the food policy agenda going forward. So I'm just gonna talk about three areas. Um, one is that we need stronger and wider competition policies or antitrust. And these kind of policies, and have been quite narrow in recent decades, focusing almost exclusively on the price impacts of mergers and acquisitions. So in other words, the, the way the laws are written and this started in the US and, and spread globally is that firms can be really big and powerful, but if it brings lower prices to consumers, then typically those deals are, are approved and the concentration is allowed, the concentration is supported through consolidation of these firms. And so while pricing is important, as I talked about, it's not the only issue that matters. And sometimes companies can actually lower prices as a weapon to drive out competitors. So there are calls right now for antitrust policies to consider the impact of markets consolidation on the structure of markets more broadly, rather than just focusing narrowly on prices. Antitrust policies used to do this back in the early uh, part of the 20, the 19, sorry, the 20th century, um, but in recent decades, the enforcement of those regulations has become more relaxed. It's also important to ensure that competition policies articulate better with strong public policies in other areas for environmental protection, social, social issues, labor and health regulations to prevent large firms from exploiting their market power in ways that can undermine these other goals. This is a really important area and it's, it's quite a tricky one because antitrust law is actually narrow. It's about uh, markets and market power. And an example of this is when um, the big uh, input companies were trying to merge in 2015, 2016, the EU competition head, um, Margaret Vestager, she had to answer all of these 5,000 letters she got from, from people saying, you know, we can't let these mergers go forward. They're going to lead to environmental problems or health problems. And she had to say, our laws say nothing about environment and health. We can only focus on um, the market dynamics. So it's quite interesting. So what we need is a way to better articulate antitrust with these other kinds of public policy regulations. And I would add, we need more coordination internationally to ensure um, the public interest is protected all countries so that countries so companies can't just seek out the least um, the least common denominator we also need more public sector support for alternative agricultural models uh, as i've stressed over and again governments have propped up large agribusiness enterprises in the industrial model for over a century and it's time for governments to step up and put more money into alternative and non-profit focused uh, initiatives in the food and agriculture sector. It could mean uh, investing in initiatives to promote agroecology, for example, or open source seeds, or even small scale seed businesses or organics. All of these areas of research receive just a tiny fraction of the budgets of public research funding right now. And so it's really important that governments shift back towards um, prioritizing the goals of the, the planet, people and farmers rather than these large uh, companies. And finally, we need measures to curb corporate influence in the policy process. And there's a lot that governments can do here. Um, you know, already some governments require disclosure of lobbying activities, and this is important. This is where we can get data on, on how much they're spending. Um, but there could be stricter measures to prevent conflicts of interest. That's really important. Um, and governments can also do more to open up spaces for more democratic participatory um, venues for people, people, farmers, civil society, et cetera, to engage in food policy and governance. Um, and these measures, I should state, they're just a start. The current system we have has been shaped and continually reinforced by concentrated firms. And we 
you know, those firms have radically transformed food production over the past 150 years, and especially the past 100 years. So if we want to have a hope of transforming food systems in a way that nourish, nourishes people and provides livelihoods into the long future, it's essential that food systems policy and government governance take measures to reduce the power of concentrated corporations in the sector. So I will, I will end up here and just remind you of the three big takeaways that I wanted you to, to gain from this, from this talk. Um, first is that corporate concentration of power in the agricultural input sector has long roots, and these firms gained this power not just because they were the most efficient or competitive firms, but these large firms have had other technological, political, and market advantages that have enabled them to dominate. And it's important to recognize that corporate influence isn't just since the 1980s, as is often implied in the literature on the, what we call the corporate food regime, but in the input sector, corporate dominance and its role in shaping food systems date back, dates back over 100 years. And second, concentrated firms have been able to exert different kinds of power over food systems for over a century, which has enabled them to shape markets, innovation, and policy in ways that impact the food system. In short, they've been central players in shaping the very industrial food system itself that dominates today. And that system contributes to a number of problems that we all agree need to be addressed. And third, addressing corporate concentration is essential if we want to truly transform food systems today to promote justice and sustainability. Corporate concentration, as I said, it's not the only cause of problems in food systems, but it's an important influence on food system outcomes. And the Food Systems Summit, as I said, it failed to take this issue seriously, but we must address it if we want to ensure more diverse uh, and just and sustainable food systems going forward. So those measures that, that we can start with stronger antitrust, more public support for alternative research, research into alternative agricultural systems and curbing corporate influence in the sector. And with that, I will say thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Jennifer Clapp. If you want to send her emails, you can. If you want to reach her on Twitter, it's at Jen Clapp. Um, I've been Dr. Christian Reynolds. This has been Food Thinkers. Thank you so much. Can everybody again, I know you can't see us all, but we are all applauding you, Professor Clapp. This has been a amazing talk. Thank you so much. We have so many questions we've not got time for, but thank you so, so much for coming and talking to us today at Food Thinkers. Thank you again. Just a reminder to those on, on the way out that um, the next Food Thinkers will be on the 10th of November, which will be a COP26 special about um, our response to the food system and climate change. From myself and the rest of the food policy team here at City University of London, thank you again, Professor Clapp, for coming and talking to us. And thank you for agreeing to do it over Zoom, much lower carbon footprint. And it has been an absolute pleasure being beamed into your home. So. Thank you very much and have a great rest of the day. And thank you very much, Christian and the whole team at City. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks. Bye, everybody. <laughs>